Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Lewis. I am Director of Gastrointestinal Oncology at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah. But the reason I'm addressing you today is I'm also quite active on social media in medicine uh, and in oncology in particular. And my goal with this talk is to explain a little bit about why I'm interested in this particular platform and hopefully show you its utility for your practice uh, and your networking. And like any good social media maven, I have to plug my handle. I am at Mark Lewis MD on Twitter, not a creative handle, I'll point out, uh, but rather a descriptive one. And I'll also kind of walk you through the anatomy of my Twitter bio and how the platform has been really useful for me at various stages in my career. And I think it's actually particularly uh, germane that we'd be discussing this topic after ASCO. So let's get into it. So why Twitter? Why of all the various forms of communication available to us today, why Twitter in particular? Well, the simplest answer is it is currently, as of this recording in 2021, the dominant digital platform for doctors to engage with one another and to the extent that they feel comfortable, the public. One thing to state from the very, very outset is Twitter is quite deliberately public. Anything that you tweet can be seen by anybody with a search engine. And my uh, example for this is always quite adorably. My mother uh, is following me on Twitter, not by being on Twitter herself, but by Googling everything I tweet. So just an example there that everything you put on this uh, platform is, is quite visible and visible to everyone on the internet, whether they're a member of Twitter or not. The three C's I'm going to invoke here are curation, contribution, and connection. Um, and I'm not trying to just make a trite mnemonic. All three of those things are the real reason uh, for my involvement uh, in Twitter. I'll try to explain each one in turn. And then lastly, but again, contemporaneously, this is a way of attending a conference virtually. And what I mean by virtual attendance is not the fact that COVID has forced us away from in-person meetings and towards conferences that have to be conducted digitally, but I'm talking about the meta meeting, the conversation that happens organically uh, around our conferences. And ASCO is the best example, as I'll cite numerous times. It is basically our Super Bowl. It's the biggest meeting of our uh, oncology calendar. And the chatter and the activity around that can be measured like this. So this is a nodal map of oncologists talking around a past ASCO meeting. And it allows us to visualize the networks that we know already exist. And so one of the points I'm gonna to try to drive home is joining any new platform can seem daunting. And in fact, as I'll get into, there are social media applications that are quite beyond me at this point. But I feel really comfortable on Twitter because what I think it's doing is recapitulating online a lot of the relationships that we have privately. Um, and I pointed out to many people, an email exchange especially one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but potentially even a longer uh, thread, uh, is by nature closed. And that information is not then shared with others. And again, you can argue it's a flaw, but I actually think it's a, it's a brilliant programmatic feature, is Twitter's openness and its visibility. So this conversation that you might be having with a peer is something that you can index and reference later, and other people can benefit from that exchange too. So again, this is not designed to be an overwhelming map. It's designed to show you, again, the nodal connections that this platform is, I don't think necessarily creating, although it can, but more so recapitulating. 2019, so again, I'll point out pre-COVID is arguably the inflection point of Twitter use by oncologists around the ASCO annual meeting. And there's a, a company called Simpler, uh, and they do a lot of work in social media metrics and particularly around healthcare. Uh, whether it's an uh, organization uh, convening its meeting or even activity between meetings, between that punctuated equilibrium uh, where patients and advocates are also contributing to the conversation. And what you can see here, again, from 2015 to 2019 is the steady climb, which has only continued uh, in positions tweeting around ASCO. Now, at some point we are gonna hit a, a threshold uh, but for the moment, I would argue that Twitter remains in its ascendancy as the social media platform used around our most important professional meetings, but around other conferences too. I'm pretty heavily involved in the SWOG cooperative group. Uh, and SWOG has long 
had a digital engagement arm. And uh, again, Twitter has been um, the number one, not the exclusive, but the number, no, number one way of um, oncologists contributing there too. So I don't wanna overwhelm you. And at first this is gonna look like chaos, but this is again, a, um, a data map of conversations, again, around ASCO 19. And what's happening here is these swirls that you see are actually hives of activity and conversation happening around specific topics. And to no one's surprise, who's ever been to ASCO, you get the most activity around plenary session, just like you would if we were there in McCormick Place. So rather than gathering 40,000 people together under one roof, Twitter is allowing at least that many, if not more, to talk about topics, dissect abstracts, sometimes have very vigorous debate, which I think is in the spirit of scientific dialectic, around these various presentations. Um, and again, this was an in-person meeting, and this is the degree of online activity was happening even when we could still get together one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I would argue, and there's again evidence for this, that with COVID and with the shift to virtual meetings, I think there's always gonna be now a hybrid model where we have in-person get-togethers, uh, but also really the meta meeting uh, happening online. So this was the trend continuing uh, beyond uh, ASCO 19. Uh, and into 20. And so a group called OncoAlert, uh, which is really a, um, a, a wonderful aggregation of content experts in different tumor types, they were particularly interested in, and they're, they're led by a, an oncologist, a wonderful man called Gil Morgan, who's the lead author on this abstract. They were interested in looking again at the growth uh, of Twitter around ASCO. And so what they are uh, interestingly comparing here is the number of tweets at the meetings versus the impressions, the number of times the tweets were seen. And what you can see, if you cast your eye across the top row and across the bottom row, first of all, going from left to right, you can see that the number of impressions essentially grew and not even in a linear fashion, it exploded and doubled uh, into the billions uh, between um, ASCO 19 and ASCO 20. At the same time, curiously, between ASCO 19 and ASCO 20, the number of absolute tweets dropped. So how do you explain that? Well, you can explain that by the fact that oncologists are actually gaining more influence. So even though the number of tweets went down, the impressions went up. And one way of interpreting that is you can say more signal, less noise. Um, again, without denigrating our pharmaceutical partners, uh, there have been efforts by ASCO to curtail uh, tweeting uh, by industry sponsors during the meeting. And again, that has reduced uh, some of the marketing content and allowed uh, the academy really to have a very, very vig vigorous conversation indeed. Um, and so I think you'll find uh, higher and higher yield, the more and more oncologists themselves are contributing to the platform. And that's not to denigrate patients and advocates and we'll get to them too. The other thing that's fascinating is to think about Twitter. And again, this is at meetings and also between meetings as an educational tool and particularly a way to flatten hierarchies in academic medicine and allow our trainees, our fellows, our residents, our medical students to participate. Um, you know, I was interested in oncology uh, even in college and beforehand. And so I always knew this is what I wanted to do. And frankly, if I had access uh, to a platform like this and I could have communicated with the people in the field I really admired, I think it would definitely have spurred on my professional development. Regardless, what they're doing here is a very interesting um, exercise, the Twitter Journal Club. So we're all used to Journal Club. It's a, um, a nice feature of many, many academic training programs. And it really encourages us to be rigorous um, analyzers of our peer reviewed literature. And we'll also get to how that dovetails with Twitter in a second. So what they did here uh, was basically on a monthly basis convene on Twitter, uh, a Journal Club. And the way this would work is they would pre-announce what the article under discussion would be. And then they would prearrange a time for people to gather online. Uh, another phrase for that is tweet chat. So it does require some synchronization, but it is also amazing because it allows people across time zones and across land masses, because this is truly an international platform, as you can see there from the map on the right of the, of the, the global activity. Uh, you can uh, communicate and correspond with uh, colleagues at other institutions and even in other countries. And what I'm getting at here is this is a wonderful way of of fellows and faculty to um, exchange information uh, in a way that's not always possible um, outside of a formal training program. 
What's really interesting is they surveyed here participants in Journal Club and found that, you know, this was likely to change their practice, increase their confidence in interpreting clinical trial data, um, gaining experience with critical uh, literature appraisal. But interestingly, the most common outcome was it allowed them to interact with individuals they might not have otherwise. And that's where I'm going to underscore the connection and the networking potential um, of this platform. I would also argue that there's a non-binary approach to the peer-reviewed literature and social media. And ideally, there's a synergistic overlap of this Venn diagram. And I'll point out, the journals recognize this, even the big names like Lancet and Lancet Oncology and the New England Journal and so on, tend to have their cake and eat it too. So of course, they're going to vet and publish the work that they think is the most meritorious, but they're also savvy enough to know in this media climate that you get more attention for any given article if you tweet about it. And so the Lancet and others will, will announce when there is a new finding of note. And this is so hugely helpful as a consumer. So now you're curating your feed in knowing uh, what new information is out there. Because as we'll discuss in a second, it is increasingly a deluge that no one person can handle and no one oncologist can know. So again, I, I did argue uh, in Hemong today um, that the use of social media is evolving in oncology from being seen as frivolous. Uh, and I'll talk in a sec about my origin stories with the platform uh, now almost 10 years ago to now becoming an effective way to share information in parallel with the peer reviewed literature. These two things do not have to be in conflict. Ideally, they work together. So in the last decade, I've seen the perception of oncology social media go from borderline unprofessional to helpful to now I would argue almost practically mandatory to uh, keep up and, and keep up, I mean, both the findings that are presented at our conferences, the near constant flow of new data and evidence from our literature, and keep up with your peers, especially in this time when we can't get together as readily uh, by traveling and, and uh, meeting that way. So here's the rising tide of information. I did an analysis for SWOG's 50-year uh, anniversary of the amount of cancer-related literature that had come out uh, in the last half century or so. And essentially what I found was 4.6 million cancer-related articles in total. This is, of course, all indexed on PubMed. And a tsunami, if you will, of articles being released per year to the point that now we're in excess of 200,000 new cancer-related articles per year. So how do you take that fire hose of information and render it into a stream that you can handle? And, and more so, one that can, can refresh your knowledge base Meaningfully, because let's be honest, not all of those hundreds of thousands of articles are equally meritorious or impactful. And I'm really not interested in impact factor as a measurement of academic clout. I'm interested in impact factor to the extent that the good things rise to the surface. And Twitter just adds to that, because if your peers think something is worth reading and they signal that to you, uh, then you are more likely to consume it. And it's almost like it's been sort of pre-screened for you. And so now I'll tell you how I joined Twitter. So it was my first day of my first post fellowship position. So I trained at Mayo Clinic. I was joining MD Anderson. My chairman there in oncology sat me down day one and said, I want you to open a Twitter account. And he gently, uh, but firmly forced me to do it even before I left his office. And he said to me, listen, at first, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to tweet your own content. You can just use this to manage the information stream, because he said, listen, you've signed up for lifelong learning. If you practice durably the way you were trained in fellowship, eventually those ways, those methods are going to fall out of fashion and they're going to re be replaced by newer and better me methods. And indeed, he's completely right. I'm barely a decade out of my training. And some of the things that I learned when I was a fellow, frankly, if I apply them now, would be malpractice. And it's a wonderful problem to have, this constant evolution of our field. But it's also very, very overwhelming uh, unless you're able to narrow down your media diet. And I think Twitter is a great way of doing that. Another thing you may have heard of vis-a-vis uh, -vis Twitter is hashtags. So putting the number sign before a word. And this can actually be very, very meaningful. Uh, it doesn't have to be frivolous or trendy. It can allow you to sort the uh, oncology social media content. 
And indeed here, we have to give an important tip of the hat to our advocate community. The breast cancer advocates started the hashtag BCSM around breast cancer social media, that's the acronym there, a decade ago. And it was enormously successful um, and allowed the advocates and the patients to gather online, um, exchange information, sometimes exchange their own narratives, but more and more we found that it was actually directing patients towards uh, appropriate treatments and even towards clinical trial opportunities. There was this really wonderful organic conversation happening uh, where patients who, let's be honest, are particularly driven to find good information because their lives are literally at stake. Um, patients were gathering together and sharing sort of their best tips, if you will. Shortly thereafter, brain tumor social media or BTSM formed. And after that, the floodgates opened and more and more of these hashtags were developed. Now this may seem to you now like an overwhelming list, but I'll point out that for almost any cancer you can think of, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's a hashtag. Um, and this allows us to talk in subsets. So I'm a GI oncologist, but I would argue that I'm treating, you know, at least a dozen different diseases, depending on how granular you want to get, at which point in the GI tract or the accessory organs. And it's the same thing in the conversation online. So the um, hashtags that were developed now kind of specifically rather than organically are disease specific. They, their criteria for creation, they had to be short, unique, and or minimally used in Twitter. Uh, and the end in SM, and that SM is the, is the Again, the suffix that says social media, it's also a prompt for you to remember again that all online use on this platform at least is public. Hashtag uptake, as you can see here, was rapid. So again, from the um, sort of origins in 2011 with BCSM, it really just took off. And I imagine if you continue that graph, it might plateau a little bit, but I think it still continues to rise. Um, and you can see here also, that while doctors are using the hashtags, it's actually even more common that patients and advocates use it. Um, so this is not exclusive to us. And again, it was not founded by us. It was founded by our advocates. And I think it's really, really important that they be partners in conversation because they really steer us towards meaningful outcomes. They remind us of the metrics that matter. There's a huge debate right now about have we allowed false surrogates to slip into our work and, and become endpoints that don't represent things that matter to our patients. And obviously at the end of the day, the, the big two are longevity and quality of life. And the patients will tell us that, especially in these online conversations. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about my use of Twitter. So first of all, let's just step back and look at the anatomy uh, of a Twitter account. So I would advise you, uh, if you are gonna use this as part of your professional identity, that your avatar, um, you might wanna use your headshot from work. And that's what I've, I've done here. I also, as I mentioned earlier, was pretty boring in, in choosing my handle. I didn't pick anything outlandish. I picked my name. And there are a lot of Mark Lewis's, even at my own institution. There's another Mark Lewis, so we're a dime a dozen. But as it happened, I got in early enough that I was able to claim Mark Lewis MD. So you might have to find some variation of your first name, last name, middle initial um, uh, to get there, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced you can establish your own online identity. I then describe what it is that I do. So my work life, I am the director of GI oncology here. Intermountain has a very robust digital presence, so I made sure to tag them. Um, I mentioned my interests very, very briefly. Uh, and then the last sentence here, and it, and it sounds like such a simple caveat, tweets my own. Before you do this, especially if you're currently working for a healthcare institution, it will behoove you to check with your um, organization and, and likely they have a social media department if they have uh, certain critical mass, and make sure uh, that you are uh, acting in accordance with their policies. Nothing that I tweet represents my employer. This is my own output. And that tiny little disclaimer goes a long way in terms of medical legal risk. Um, and then you'll notice I mentioned there, um, I have had a Whipple myself. So I'm a GI medical oncologist, but I've also had uh, pancreatic tumors, neuro neuroendocrine tumors, not adenocarcinoma. And so I've required a Whipple. And so my header picture there is on the day of that operation. And I did something a little strange here, and this is definitely not something I recommend you trying, but I actually used my Twitter account to document the day of my surgery. And so I'm just gonna walk you through that a little bit. Um, I knew I was gonna need this surgery. I thought, how can I turn this into an educational opportunity? And I know it sounds outlandish and very strange and borderline exhibitionist, but I decided to live tweet my own Whipple, again, with the help of my social media department. So here's how I did it. Um, 
basically they followed me the entire day uh, from pre-op through the surgery and, and took pictures. And every single picture was accompanied with a, a tweet in near real time. Um, so for instance, this was uh, actually one of the favorite pictures ever taken of my wife and I, this really kind of touching moment um, where she was holding my hand before I was wheeled to the operating room. And I, I did this again because as we'll discuss, oncologists really, really need to be humanized. Uh, we'll talk about what, what a search about oncologists might yield and you might not like the results. Um, but I wanted to do this partly to show that we're people too and we also get sick and yes, we actually get cancer. So what I found fascinating was, again, if there's a non-binary um, relationship between the peer-reviewed literature and social media, there's also a non-binary relationship between traditional news outlets and Twitter. And so here, uh, one of the local uh, TV stations in Salt Lake City picked up on the story and then they broadcast it. And so I ended up getting 3 million impressions um, from the day of my surgery, which is a number far higher uh, than what I was expecting. And I think it's because I was getting amplification uh, from channels like this one. Uh, it's truly an out-of-body experience for me uh, to go back and, and read these tweets. Obviously, I was under general anesthesia at the time, but I actually have a step-by-step -step, um, now, almost like a, an instruction manual for a Whipple, although don't try this at home, uh, by which I can even show my patients what the surgery looks like. And the reason this has been so powerful for me, and this may differ you know, widely from your practice, is I treat GI cancer. I have a actually, unfortunately, minority of patients who when they come to me are resectable or borderline resectable for pancreas cancer. And we know, that while this is largely a systemic illness, that surgery for pancreatic adenocarcinoma is really the only route to cure. Even then, I have patients who are too afraid to undergo this surgery. And the Whipple is one of the more fearsome operations in, in oncology, maybe even in medicine. So I thought if I could just walk them through the steps and show them I had done it too, that that would be um, potentially helpful to even one patient. And, and sure enough, it's worked. Um, I don't sit them there in clinic and walk them through every single laborious uh, piece of the process, uh, but I am able to tell them almost like I'm uh, giving them education materials. Hey, listen, there's a, a link where I've aggregated all these tweets. They can go through it. They can see what it looks like. They can see that I came out the other end. Um, and, and indeed, I even shared them um, the good and the bad parts of, of recovery. And I, I want you to know, I know this sounds, again, like I'm making my patients care all about me. And I want you to know it's not like that. Um, because I've been open about this, I have an interesting sort of feedback loop in my practice where patients will come to me because they know that I have dealt with a malignancy of some kind. And I also understand surgery um, and specifically the Whipple. And, and I don't paint, paint too rosy a picture, just like when we're doing shared decision-making these days, we have to be very, very honest about risk and benefit. Um, I use this in my post-Whipple experience to be very candid about the fact that you don't just recover in linear fashion. So that picture on the left is me being discharged on post-op day six. What you're not seeing there is I was then readmitted and readmitted for about a month uh, during which time I had a, a nasogastric tube. And so the picture on the right is one of the most joyful moments of my life when that tube was removed uh, there with my family. So I, I do this again because we have a little bit of a PR problem, if I'm honest, and let me show you what I mean. So you might be aware that Google has an autocomplete function. So you start typing in something and it already starts suggesting how you might wanna finish your sentence. So one day as sort of a thought exercise, of where are we in terms of public perception of our specialty, I decided to type in oncologists are, and I got these results. Oncologists are murderers, oncologists are evil, oncologists are confused, and oncologists are criminals. And it did, did not get better from there, trust me. And this was shocking to me um, because all the oncologists I know are truly caring and compassionate. And I know we all try to do our best for our patients. I think what's happened the most charitable interpretation of this result is I think we've been conflated over the years with the indiscriminate toxicities uh, of the treatments that we have administered in the past. And let's be honest, even today, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, these are difficult things. We offer them in good conscience because we think they're more likely to be helpful than harmful. But if we want people to come to us and trust us, I actually think it's really important that we try to put a sympathetic and human face uh, on our name. Otherwise, I think we'll be conceived of as, you know, mad scientists and white coats giving out poison. I, I think that that is obviously unfair, uh, but clearly uh, matches some degree of public perception.
I'll also point out, and I realize this actually may be a deterrent to some people, that patients are online. Now, this is probably apocryphal, but when the FBI caught the legendary bank robber, Willie Sutton, they reportedly asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And I would argue that these days, patients are largely online. And again, COVID has actually forced, you know, necessity of being the mother of invention has forced more people online, physicians and patients alike. But I just want you to be aware that whether you choose to engage or not, there are very robust discussions happening online. Now, the patients uh, tend to migrate more to Facebook, if I'm honest, and this is not a talk about Facebook. And Facebook has its own issues with data and privacy. Twitter, to their credit, is very open about the whole platform being transparent. So that, that part, the, the messaging, you, you go in with the expectations that everyone can see what you're seeing. I think Facebook is, is different there. Um, but should you choose to, uh, you can engage patients and advocates online. Um, again, this is largely a talk about um, Twitter. I'll point out there are new platforms. I'm involved here in Salt Lake City in a collaboration between my organization, Intermountain, and the Huntsman Cancer Institute uh, to take care of adolescent young adult patients. And we have found that they in particular have migrated uh, to Instagram. Uh, so visual content there is, is literally eye-catching, but also they tend to stay there and absorb content. So we've tried again to go to where the patients are. And then finally, I'll point out that there, there is real power in, uh, in video. So again, this is something you can think about on uh, Twitter too. Videos get 1,200% uh, more engagement than a, a straight text tweet. Uh, and actually, just as a general rule, even if it's a still photo, you'll, you'll get probably ninefold more engagement than if you just write text. We are, we are visual creatures. And so there's other platforms that are uh, exploiting that um, sort of neurobiology or neuropsychology too. So TikTok is a platform that I have no experience with, but there is a very well-known, very well-respected oncologist, Dr. Don Dizon, who's actually used this as an education tool. Once again, he saw that young people were migrating to TikTok. He wanted to get out messaging, among other things, about sexual health, about HPV vaccination, potentially as a means of eradicating or at least minimizing cervical cancer. Uh, he's a gynecologic oncologist, and so he went to TikTok. My only foray here was actually recorded a video for a charity for uh, Conquer Cancer uh, Foundation and posted that to YouTube. And I was really surprised by the amount of engagement that it got. I realize these things may border on seeming, you know, again, silly or frivolous to you. My only point is you can take the lessons of these visual media and apply them back to Twitter. So if you allow me to close, um, I think Bill Gates said that people um, underestimate uh, what they can accomplish in a decade, even if they overestimate what they can accomplish in a year. And indeed, if you go back at 25 years, the progress has been simply remarkable. So this is my father. Uh, he died in 1994, uh, so more than 25 years ago. He never sent an email. He certainly never had any interaction with social media. And my point in mentioning him to you is he wrote a book that he never saw come to light of day. This was published seven years posthumously. And he worked very, very hard on it before his death, but he never actually got to hold it in, hand, in his hands. And why am I invoking this now? I'm not trying to pull on your heartstrings. I'm pointing out that we have been through, we were witnessing the second coming of the Gutenberg Press. It used to be, if you were an academic like my father, you would have to toil away on your manuscript and then go through traditional means of publication to end up seeing it you know, in ink on paper. And that process, as we know, takes years. On the flip side, and I'm not saying there's not value for books, believe me. Um, on the flip side, you can now instantaneously broadcast your message to a global audience. And the way that you can do that for free is Twitter. So I'll end by saying, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by this talk. And I wanna give you some simple tips to end on. So first of all, there is no pressure to perform. As I said, for my first several years uh, on the platform, I really just use it to curate and absorb information. Listening is not lurking. That's an epithet that is sometimes unfairly directed towards people who aren't themselves tweeting a lot. It's okay. It's okay if you don't choose to um, put out your own content. And even then, I would encourage you as a foray into um, participating in conversation, you can amplify other people's voices. You've probably heard of retweets. Literally, all you're doing there is amplifying a message that you think deserves to be heard. Uh, you can also like something, uh, and that brings it uh, greater attention. So Again, I think there's far too much 
emphasis on content generation and far too little emphasis on content amplification. I also point out, you already have a social network work. One of the things I love about medicine and oncology in particular is I think we're actually fairly close knit if you think about it. This is really just an opportunity to fortify those connections and then expand your connections and reach uh, beyond uh, your brick and mortar uh, institution. And then finally, and I just have to end on this, uh, it's very easy for people to accuse you of being performative or say you're just doing this for clout. Um, I will say I think quality trumps quantity in terms of number of tweets. And then I just encourage you to be yourself, your superpower on Twitter. What you have that very few people, other, other people have is your professional identity. And you don't have to sacrifice that to be on Twitter. I guess that's my real point is I don't think it's frivolous. I don't think it's a waste of your time. I think it's a way that you can really uh, contribute meaningfully to a very dynamic, dynamic conversation um, and also establish your presence in a whole new way that hopefully feels palatable to you. So with that, I will close. And thanks for letting me address you on the topic of Twitter for oncologists.